<laughs> they, didn't, they didn't land one. They hooked up quite a few. Uh, probably the time I was there for was about three hours. They probably hooked up a dozen, but they never landed one. Those fish just, you know, throw those, those hooks like nothing. It's just, but it's fun to watch them jump out the water, though. That really is fun. Okay, so now I'm going to put my GCC hat on, Gulf Coast console, uh, and talk about some of the issues going on with fishing in Louisiana. First of all, uh, a little bit of background. The uh, FFF has been in existence since 1964. Um, and it's, I first became a member in, in 1990, and in 1996, I was asked to be on the Southeastern Council Board. That's when Louisiana was in the Southeast Council. And uh, I asked the question, I said, uh, you know, does FFF have an executive director? Do we have some mechanism to raise money and everything else, like TU and DU and CCA and all that? And we thought I insulted their mothers. It was like, Kutch, that's not how we do things around here. We're not like TU, we're not like DU, you know, we're never going to be. And uh, I understood, you know, they want to be like the Garden Club, they want to be like the National Photographic Society, you know, and just do fly fishing and fly time and so on. Conservation, they did do, but it was a small part. And how small? Well, if you go to the Bass Pro Shops in Denham Springs, they have the conservation wall up there. They probably have about two dozen uh, emblems, logos of conservation organizations across the United States. Guess which one was missing? FFF. So we weren't, I guess we just weren't considered much of a conservation organization. So about 2016 or so, the uh, the movers and shakers in the fly fishing industry were troubled by what was going on with FFF. Um, you could remember that slide where we're, since 2010, we're getting members, I mean, we're getting new participants to the sport. Fly fishing's booming like it is today. But the membership of FFF was going down like this. And the annual um, revenues were going down. We were in the red about six to $9,000 each year. So they said, well, we need to change some things. And so they hired a consulting firm. They came back. They did surveys. And what they found out from all these new fly fishermen, especially young fly fishermen, was it's great that we want to learn about fly casting and fly tying and fly fishing education. But we need this organization to represent us on all these issues that are popping up. So we need to be conservation-minded, oriented. And so the board, uh, the consulting company said, let's rebrand ourselves. We're going to, you know, we changed the name of the organization to FFI, which is Fly Fishers International. We got a new motto. We got a logo change. And uh, we hired an executive director for the first time in the organization's history, a paid executive director. And he's a gem. His name is Patrick Barry. And he came in and the the chairman of the board was elected is Tom Logan. He's a retired fish and wildlife uh, biologist with uh, Florida Fish and Game. And uh, they put together, you know, a whole new game plan, if you will, for uh, the organization with regards to conservation. And uh, so we started establishing things like conservation partnerships. We increase the amount of money that's on conservation grants and scholarships. But that last one right there, we've put greater emphasis on conservation activism. So if there's something going on somewhere, we hear about it, we act, we write letters, we contact congressmen or people in Washington and let them know. And we work with our partners to try to get something done an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Can I ask a question about that? Well, no, go ahead. Go over the slide. Okay. So I was elected in 2018 with the current board. That was A.J. Rosenbaum Company. 
and uh, they asked me to be conservation director. And so what I did, I was trying to think of what to do with you know, our conservation uh, policy and everything. And I just basically copied what these geniuses at, FI, at FFI were doing. I mean, you know, they had the brain trust all working together, putting in a program and everything else. I just copied what they did. Why well, reinvent the wheel, right? So uh, uh, I, the policy we have uh, for our grants, the things, the things we do for conservation in the council uh, are almost identical to what they do at the federal level, at the national level. And we also created the Sun Catch Challenge, which is a council-based program similar to FFI bass catch and cut catch programs. And Ben Roussel, you all know Ben? Yeah, he's the director of that. And you couldn't have a better person running Sun Catch Challenge any, anywhere. He's a, he's a professor when it comes to sunfish. And... Uh, I hope we can get him because he's got a tremendous presentation on uh, on panfish. We get him for a program. So we've also taken a more active role in fisheries issues. We've created our own partnerships with regional conservation groups, and then like <laughs> that's one on my list right there. We want to try to do is get like a video podcast, either quarterly or bi-monthly, and cover special topics and some of those will be conservation oriented. So we do have conservation grants in the Gulf Coast Council. By the way, do y'all know what the council is? I guess I didn't mention that. The geographic area? Yeah. So the Gulf, the FFI <coughs> is broken down by councils, geographic areas. And the Gulf Coast Council is Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, coastal Florida, and Panhandle, I mean, coastal Alabama and Panhandle, Florida. So, by the way, in the Suncatch Challenge, you can catch a fish anywhere in the state of Alabama and qualify. You don't have to be an F a GCC member. You can be an FFI member living in Massachusetts as long as you fish the waters of Louisiana, Mississippi, anywhere in Alabama and northwest Florida and catch a sunfish there. You can get... Sunfish Award. By the way, Bill is one of our latest Sunfish Challenge recipients right there. He caught nine of the qualifying 18 species. So he's getting a mug sometime soon. <laughs> we got it on order. So we do have conservation grants. It's $500 per grant uh, maximum and uh, two grants per year for $1,000 maximum. And uh, we hope to increase that, but the form to do it is almost identical for the form for the national uh, grant. So if you fill this grant out and you meet the qualifying, you could get federal money. We could get the national money. Have any of those out? No, and the reason why is because I, I came up with this, I put it together during the time of the pandemic. And so since the pandemic's been so I had three requests for grant money that came like, oh, I think the GCC should be doing this. And you know, they sent me an email. Can y'all do this, this project over here? And I said, okay, find me a local organization with a project leader, and here's the form, and it has all that information on there. And they go, oh, I thought y'all were gonna do it. No, that's not how it works, either at the regional council or the national level. You have to have a local entity that is responsible for that project a project leader, if you will, and somebody who can report back on the success or failure of the project. So, a little more complicated than it seems, but um, like I said, we've given a lot of money at the national level uh, out. In fact, uh, I think we gave out over $38,000 this year. That's small potatoes compared to DU and TU and others, but realize, we're just getting back. We're playing the game now for only about three years now. You know, we so hope to. Oh uh, yeah, they're in the conservation section. That was my question. The only thing I found for conservation activities we were doing was signing on to letters, and that was it. I didn't see anything, and maybe I just didn't find it. 
So I was, that's, that's I'll, question, I'll go take a look. FFI yeah. Besides just signing up. Away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is important. It's in the little bulletin that we have, but I will check and see it. That's a good question. So here's some of the issues that I say we've been involved. The Gulf Coast Council has been involved since 2018. Okay, in Alabama, um, they did a flounder closed season during the month of November. They did flounder change uh, from five daily to uh, from 10 daily to five daily and so on. Sea trout change from 10 daily uh, to six daily, and of course some size change, uh, size change limits as well. So here's the deal with flounder, and you're going to see this across the board. Every state now has a closed season for flounder, South Atlantic and Gulf, um, during either October or November or both. And the reason is because that's the spawning migration for flounder. Flounder are not necessarily being overfished. The problem is, I hate to say this, climate change. The the waters of the South Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico have been quite a bit warmer than they used to be. When a flounder with XY chromosomes is about yay big, they make a sexual determination whether it be a male or a female flounder. And if the water is above a certain temperature, they become males, where they're at the point where they're becoming about 90% uh, males. Problem with males is they don't lay eggs and they don't get very big. I mean, a 12 inch male is a big male flounder. The females get whopping big. And of course, they lay lots of eggs. So, by closing the seasons and changing the limits, they're hoping that they can get, bring back a uh, flounder. Uh, the other thing is they're doing some stocking programs. Alabama stocks uh, flounder now. And at the ICAST, I talked to a representative from Alabama uh, outdoors over there, and he said that uh, they're seeing quite a bit of success now in their flounder. Recruitment. So here's uh, Florida Panhandle. There's some changes that took place. And we also got involved in crappie in Mississippi on uh, the four north uh, uh, reservoirs up north. Then we get to Louisiana. Now, all those I uh, just mentioned, you know, I got involved with the, the writing letters and making contacts with partners and contacting local clubs and everything else and getting support and pretty much passed, you know, what the biologists wanted, we got. Well, the biologists said, I, I should say, we got. Louisiana, different story. We struggle because we've got politicians. <laughs> Not that those other states don't, but we got some politicians that just don't get it. Uh, we did manage to the close season flounder here in Louisiana. Menhaden is one we've been fighting. We've had a bill now every year. It gets through the House easily. It gets through the Senate and the Senate Natural Resources Committee uh, chairman, who is a been uh, receiving quite considerable donations from one of the big Manhattan companies. He tables it to the end of the session. At the end of the session, you have to put the bill into motion. But the problem is, at the end of the session, you've got like 100 bills trying to go through at the end. So the bill never gets to, to the governor's desk. And there's even a question whether the governor will even sign it. He said before that he'd likely veto the bill. So we're trying to be the only, we're the only state right now that doesn't have a buffer zone for Menhaden or a quota. So we have 90% of the Menhaden harvest in the United States. A um, hundred million pounds to be exact per year. And it's all close to shore. That's the problem. So this is all in state waters, but not just in state waters. I mean, there's videos out there, you can go find them on YouTube, where they're right there on the beach harvesting menhaden. Problem with that is, guess what, where spawning speckled trout and spawning redfish are during the summer months. They're out there spawning and feeding on menhaden. They depend on menhaden for food. And uh, so we're not just killing by bycatch these large speckled trout and these bull redfish, 
We're also taking the food away, which lowers their fecundity and so on. So that's an issue that's going on. We've been pushing for a half mile from state shoreline. They finally passed one regulation that's a quarter of a mile, which is ridiculous. Like I said, every other state's at least a mile and has a quarter. We don't. Um, spotted sea trout, y'all heard about that. We're trying to reduce the uh, limit on that because it's being overfished. And red drum is the same. So what's the problem with redfish and speckled trout? Uh, a lot of things. Loss of habitat. We've lost diversity in habitat. And I'll tell you why it's important. You used to be able to go to Golden Meadow and you fish on the east side of Golden Meadow out there. And you had canals that were 8 to 10 feet deep. And now all those canals are about 3 feet deep. They've all filled in with sediment. They used to have grass. There's no grass out there. There used to be grass on the north end of Catfish Lake. There's no grass out there. Uh, Yellow Cotton Bay used to be 40 feet deep. Sulfur Mine used to be 40 feet deep. These were areas where the speckled trout and redfish during the hard winter freezes would go in to escape and survive the, the cold. We don't have those of sediment that filled up and everything. So now we're having more winter freezes than we ever had. Not as big as the 1989 event, but more small ones. And so that's a problem as well. I mentioned about decline in forage. When you remove all that food from those spawning fish, it's significant. Um, freshwater discharges and low salinity levels. We've had record high river water for eight years of the last 10 years on the Mississippi River. The last two years have been uh, down, like this year. And so they're starting to see speckled trout back in Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Bourne. They need that salinity because for their eggs, uh, they both need about 20 parts per thousand for the eggs to float and hatch. Uh, increase in anglers and angler effort. When the current regulations were, were written or set up was in 1988 and 1990. And uh, we've almost tripled the number of anglers we have, saltwater anglers, since then. And of course, angler efficiency. You know, we have more electronics and everything else than we've ever had. So here's, uh, here's the redfish escapement rate. The two things about redfish, uh, redfish for one, we harvest before they reach maturity. So this is where escapement rate comes in. It's how many of these fish will escape the harvest and get to the spawning stock. And uh, we're in bad shape, so you can see. We've gone down quite a bit. But the good news is we can rebound that pretty fast uh, if we make appropriate changes in reduction of harvest. But here's the one that hurts. Um, this is the spawning potential ratio. And it's the number of fish available to spawn as if, the race of the as if they were not fished at all. And there's a conservation standard that is set by the federal government on there of 30%. And uh, currently, the cons we, had the currently um, we, had, we need a harvest reduction of at least 35% to get back to the conservation standard. We're actually, right now, above the standard. But this is like a car going down the highway and there's a bridge out. We have to break now. Um, if, if we wait till we get to where the, uh, the bayou is or whatever, we're going to go into the bayou. We have to start breaking now in order to avoid that. And so that's why you see that curve is going to go down. Things are going to get worse before they go get, get better again. Uh, and there's a long period of time in terms of recovery for spawning potential ratio. So the biologists at Wildlife and Fishery put together a whole series of charts. You can go out there to their website and you can see all this data for yourself. But here's the easy one right here. Now, just before we were talking about this with the biologist and trying to figure out what we were going to do and what you know, options we were going to recommend, um, the Louisiana legislature passed a resolution unanimously to ban 
harvest redfish over the slot. In other words, bull redfish. So anything over 27 inches and ban that. And like I said, passed unanimously. So that gave the commission what they needed to make some regulation changes. It also made it easier on us because if you have that one fish over, it becomes much harder uh, on the creel. You have to have a small slot limit and you're going to have to have two fish per day to get to your reduction uh, goals. So by eliminating the bull redfish uh, harvest, we were able to work with keeping a little more redfish and maybe a bigger slot. But this is the harvest reduction uh, as it applies up there. And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, you can see the 35% right here is the very uh, minimum the biologists say we have to do. If we do that, we can recover SBR in 27 years. If we go to 40%, we can do it in 12 years. And uh, if we can do it in well, 13 years, if we do 45%, we can do it in uh, 11 years or so. So it was easy for us to make a determination on that. We said, we can't wait 26 years. So our recommendation to the commission was to do it, was a proposal. We had two proposals, in fact. Um, one of them was an 18 to 26 inch slot, three daily creel, no overslot. That was a 45% reduction. As you can see, escapement rate, we get there. The conservation standard for that in two years. SPR, we get there in 11 years. The NOI is put forward by Wildlife and Fisheries was an 18 to 27 inch slot, four fish creel, no overslot. Only a 30%, 6% reduction. That would have taken three years for escapement rate to meet the conservation standard and 26 years to meet the SPR standard. So at the hearing earlier this month, the, uh, we had over two dozen uh, guides, fly, uh, mostly fly fishing, in fact, guides come to the commission meeting and get up and speak. And there were others like myself and several others who were in support. And they got up in there and they said, this is ridiculous. We can't wait 26 years to get. And of course, they told their own, you know, and their old stories about how the fishing's gone down from what they used to do. You know, they used to see 100 redfish a day. Now they look if they see 10 a day and so on like that. And uh, they said, we just can't wait that long. And so one of the commissioners was listening to this. He said, well, how long do you think uh, it would take? And he said, he says, well, it got to be at least, it can't be more than 10 years. So he threw out this right there, 18 to 24 inch slot, a three daily creel limit. That's a 55% reduction in harvest, and it gets the SBR target in nine years. And you could have knocked me over with a feather, because I never thought I'd ever see a commission, Wildlife and Fisheries Commission, vote in favor of a, a measure that was more conservation oriented, more conservation than what we, or CCA, or the guides, or anybody, was going to propose. They actually did that, and then they passed it four to two. So now it has to go through a comment period, and then it's going to go to the legislature, the Legislative Oversight Commission Committee, which consists of House Natural Resources and Senate Natural Resources Committee members, and they vote on it. And uh, if it meets their approval, then it becomes rule. So. Does that also get rid of the guide limit? Uh, yes. Yes. But I tell you, as I mentioned, the guide limit is just like 0.8%. Yeah, it's not, not insignificant. I mean, it's not significant at all. It's a feel-good measure more than anything. But yeah, this... So, in, you know, on social media and everywhere else, I'm hearing... A lot of people are okay with that. Uh, if there's any problem, it's that the slot limit is too small. 
And so I think that, you know, our proposal right there, our number one proposal, 18 to 26, might be a fallback if they, you know, they reject this on there. And it still t gets you there in 11 years, just two years longer, but not 26. That's ridiculous. Any other is, questions about this? Is, right? a, is the Menhaden limit, is that tied into all this as well, or is that? No. But you see, that was one of the things that a lot of people said. You know, they got up and said, we need to do something about the Menhaden too. And they want to do something about it with this notice of intent, which is, you know, a proposed rule. But they couldn't because it has to be announced prior to the meeting. If you're going to do something like that, you're going to do an NOI, a proposed rule, you have to announce it, you know, uh, a week or so before the, the, council, the, the commission meets. Is the Menhaden Inn still owned by foreign Indians? Yeah. Yes. Tremendous lobby, I imagine. Yes. I'm told that they tripled their number of lobbyists in the last couple of years to fight this legislative move uh, to get it passed. You never did that. I can't. Uh, when the plants running, you can't breathe. What do they do with Menhaden? Uh, fish oils, and, you know, um, cat food. The cat food. Just a wide variety of things. Anything that stinks. <laughs> That's right. So there was no fraction on the speckled trout changes. Really oh, I'm going to get to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So this is just a, uh, for FYI. What are the regulations for redfish in other states? Um, as you can see, uh, we're the only state that has more than three, except for Georgia. But Georgia's having a problem. They're below the conservation standards as well. And so there's a proposal to limit, to dr drop it to three fish per day also. Texas has something that they will allow uh, one fish, oversized fish a year. You get a tag. And so you can keep one oversized fish a year. And Don Dubuque was talking on his radio show out of New Orleans. And he was talking about, well, this is going to kill the state records for redfish. You know, if you can't keep a big redfish like that. And so I asked Jason and the guys at the Wildlife and Fisheries, I said, can we do something like Texas? And they said, well, we can't because Louisiana Creole, which is the program they do for offshore fisheries and apparently includes redfish as well, uh, has to be approved by uh, NOAA. And it had some restrictions on tagging fish. So we could do it, but they'd have to go through this whole approval process and everything. So that may be something that, that gets done down the line, but it's not going to happen, you know, within the next couple of years. So um, I will say something else. Texas, South Carolina, and Alabama stock redfish, juvenile redfish, redfish fingerling. Texas, you can see, stocks 19 million fingerlings per year. It makes up about 9% of their harvest. So it does have some impact. I've heard rumors that they're going to try to maybe look into maybe a hatchery for Louisiana. Again, we'll see where that goes. So this is speckled trout. And kind of similar, it has the same problems that we have with, with redfish. And uh, it's been going down now for some time. The conservation standard is 14%. And right now, we're at 9%. So we're in the hole. And I can tell you from personal experience, it ain't nothing like it used to be. Anywhere. Even the spots that are still good. Um, it's, just, it's been terrible. Uh, so the good news is because speckled trout grow so fast and they mature so young, any changes we make, we can see instantaneous uh, improvement. But it's going to have to be quite a bit of a uh, change because you can see right there, we need a, a harvest reduction of at least 15% uh, uh, to get to the conservation standard. So this is what um, wildlife fisheries, the biologists of wildlife and fisheries came up with, this chart right here. And they said, okay, um, tell us what you want for creel limit and size limit and everything else 
It's got to reach at least that 15% mark right there. So uh, we said, let's do better than 15%. Okay, why do we always want to be right there teetering on the edge? Let's do like most states do and have an optimum yield fishery. Okay, and we said 19, 20%. So we proposed 14 inches, uh, 15 fish limit. As you can see right there, we get to 19% SBR goal. Uh, we got what we wanted. Okay, first of all, CCA did not get involved with this early. And we were the only ones. We went out and advertised it to the world. We even got published in a newspaper and magazine with our proposal. So we did a bang up job on that. People were contacting Rodney Sh uh, Shoemaker, is it? Rep State Representative from Leeville? He didn't. You know, he's never involved in saltwater. Uh, thing. He said he had more people contacting him about f moving the limit to 14 inches on there. Than, uh, and he said, speckled trout. <laughs> so we did a bang up job on that. And uh, they made a proposal of. Uh, 13 and a half inches. Well, I don't know why. They did some kind of little, uh, 13 and a half inches instead of 14. Uh, and it goes to the, it passes the committee, commission, it goes to the Legislative Oversight Committee and gets shot down by the Legislative Oversight Committee. And CCA had taken the position and, uh, you know, I was told they lobbied, CCA lobbied the, the, uh, the Oversight Committee, they wanted to keep a 12-inch minimum size limit. And their reasoning was, if you make it 14 inches, you're going to have a 90% harvest of females only. As you can see, that's not right. But, uh, but if you did that proposal right there, which is 12-inch minimum, 15 fish daily, with two only two over 19 inches, uh, your SPR goal is 14%. What is the conservation standard? 14. Yeah, so four, you're going to get to 14, which is the standard. You're going to be right there again. Okay, that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> you know? Uh, Wildlife and Fisheries Commission proposal, like I said, was 13 and a half right there. And that would have been 17%, and that would have been safe. So now the commission has to do another proposal to the, uh, uh, for the committee going forward. They have to amend their original NOI, Notice of Intent. Uh, well, they didn't come out good at all. What happened there? Uh, what I was going to try to highlight was that uh, Louisiana Spied Sea Trout Study when they did some sampling, they found that the three largest trout they had, all over 27 inches, were all males. So male trout can get big. Yeah, they don't grow as fast as female trout. They grow slower, but they can get really big. That line right there is nothing more than just a mean average. If you look at the actual data points, like in Condre's study, you'll see a cloud, and that's what it is. It's just a cloud of data points. So you can have plenty of big fish after, after 14 inches. That's that green line right there. And that's the argument we made, is every other state, there are 11 states that manage for spotted sea trout, every state but Louisiana has a minimum size at least 14 inches. And why is that? Because that 14-inch trout, that's a... That's a, uh, a prime spawner right there in an age two to three year old. Um, you, have, you have the big, biggest combination of number of fish and number of eggs. That's the way to put it. So you want to try to protect those fish as much as possible. Uh, Any questions? I covered a lot of stuff right there.